Hello, my name is Matthew Fleming. I work at Pure Storage. Um, this talk is Arthur O'Dwyer's fault, in a way. We were chatting at CppCon um, uh, two years ago, maybe. And I was saying, you know, I'd kind of like to talk, but I never feel like I have anything to talk about. And he's like, well, surely you have something that's done at your workplace that's kind of different than what other people have done. I'm like, okay, sure, yeah. We got these smart pointers that present a slightly interesting ownership model. And he's like, okay, great, give a talk. Call it an alternate smart pointer hierarchy. And I said, okay. So I wrote it up and CPP, C++ now is nice enough to say, sure, you can talk. So uh, having watched a bunch of amazing talks about like here's things we're proposing for the standard and all, I kind of, I feel like this is underwhelming, but I hope you're not underwhelmed. There's nothing magic here, right? This is all code that you can write today. It's in C++ 11. Um, and it's not in some sense super different from what you get out of the stock smart pointers, but there's, there's enough different semantics that I think it maybe gets you thinking a little bit differently about ownership. And I think names are really important. Um, it, I think the way we name things ends up how, affecting how we think about them. <coughs> so I have an outline which is really more useful if somebody actually wanted to look at the slides later to know where to jump to because no one cares about outlines. So <coughs> motivation and history. So it's important to know, it, because we have this weird system, it's important to know how I got there. We didn't start from the beginning and say, hey, I really want to design a brand new smart pointer. Let me think about what I want in it. That's not how we got to where we are. And so I think it's important to give a little bit of uh, the history. So in October, in October 2009, Pure Storage was founded. And they knew that we'd be a, the company would be dealing with, I'm going to say they and we intermittently. I wasn't there at the time. Um, I've been with the company four and a half years, so I have a lot of history behind me now. But um, they knew they'd be doing things related to, I'm reading data off of SSDs, I'm writing it, I'm going to have some kind of you know, storing you know, client pages, in this case, like things from iSCSI uh, protocol. I'm going to have maybe transactions. I'm going to want to look at some kind of table if we're maybe a sequence range and get a consistent snapshot of some kind of key value store. I want to iterate that key value store. And in all of these things, I wanted to be asynchronous. I wanted a, I want a, a kind of a thread model where I launch about as many threads as I have CPUs, and everything I do on them has some kind of asynchronicity built in. I don't ever want to synchronously wait for things. So I'm going to have, you know, when I want to read a flash page, I have some kind of address. I'm going to give it a buffer to read into. I want to know the result, and I have to, the return value has to be some kind of asynchronous object. And we knew we are going to do a lot of things like this. So it started off just, we don't know what the shape of the software is, but we're going to have lots of kinds of resources. I'm going to have buffers. I'm going to have these database tables, these async requests. I'm going to have to do RAID rebuilds. And I know I've got resources, so, so how do I release a resource? Well, the, the central idea is that the resource knows how to release itself. Um, you know, it may be released to a thread local free list. I may be calling the system free. There may be a recycling pool involved. Um, it may be some kind of combination of, of allocation and release strategies. But the implementation of this resource knows how it should be released because it knows how it was allocated. So in the beginning, the code is written in C. There's no destructor, so I need some kind of new name for this operation, and somebody came up with dispose. So a lot of our classes that represent resources back in the C world, they would have a, uh, a function pointer. This is what you call when you're done with me. You call my dispose method from the object I handed you. And so it's all very manual because it's in C. There's no smart pointers, but the res you don't de necessarily delete, or sorry, uh, free a foo. You just tell it, go dispose yourself. I'm done with you. And that's where all of this really started, was with this concept that, that resources know how they were allocated and therefore how they should be released. And so we didn't stay in C for very long, but the initial code was development was done in C because it's a systems company. System software is C, right? At least in 2009, that was still mostly true. Uh, one of the founders really didn't like C++, um, and another one really did. Uh, it turns out during a lot of meetings when they're talking about architecture, the founder who liked C++ was doing an awful lot of typing. And at some point when they were all discussing, hey, how should we do this? He said, yeah, that's cute and all, but here's a working implementation of something. So the working implementation won because working code is better than ideas. Um, so there was this great renaming somewhere in 2010. I couldn't find it in the Git history, but somewhere in 2010, everything was renamed from .c to .cpp, but it was all C code still, but being compiled now using a C++ compiler. Um, and the idea was, you know, I really, really need to get to MVP as fast as possible. I need to get a product out there in a customer's hands that actually does something. I don't have a month to rewrite all of my C into C++. 
but I already and I but but I can start by rewriting some things. And if I know a little bit about how compilers implement vtables, well, I can write C code that just you know does some pointer subtraction and a few other funny things. And it's a really horrible thing to do. And I do not recommend you do it at all. Please do not do this. But it does allow you to slowly transform a code base from C to C++, and still in a C++ world, use normal virtual function dispatch. But in the C world, you just use function pointers. And um, so the last instances of the C code actually ended up getting deleted in 2013. Some of that code lived, it was like in a corner that just kind of worked. It was written in 2010. It worked. It never got, somebody finally got around and saying, I have a spare couple days. Let me convert it. So we actually lived with a little bit of C code doing horrible vtable hacks for quite some time. So when you're in C++, you Come, you know, you have a virtual function instead. So instead of a function pointer named dispose, it's a virtual function. And we're going to have a smart pointer. We're going to call it owned because it owns resources. So this is how you begin pivoting to C++. Um, and you add a smart pointer. The, this is relatively obvious if you've seen how smart pointers go. I've got a, you know, we use struct everywhere instead of class because um, historical reasons probably. So you have some interface type, and you're a good programmer, say, say using element type equals the interface type. You've got some somewhat obvious constructors and assignments and operator arrow and dereference and stuff like that. And I'm going to show some of that later. I've got some kind of in the details slides later. But the key thing is your smart pointer has a destructor. And in this case, you say, if I have a non-null pointer, I cast it to disposable, and I call dispose. And you, kind of, you need the cast to make sure you get the right view table. So that's the basic of I had something that knew how to release itself, and I moved to C++, and now I've got ownership over these objects. Um, and so you could ask, well, isn't that the same as just having this class dispose deleter that calls dispose, and you say it's a unique putter with my thing inside, and it's, it's semantically exactly the same thing. It does, it does about the same thing on when the, when the smart pointer itself is destroyed, it calls the dispose method. But unique pointer didn't exist in 2010, and owned as itself didn't necessarily imply s single ownership. It just meant I knew how to release myself when I called dispose. I don't know what dispose is going to do. Um, and the unique part of unique pointer kind of implies it's definitely a unique ownership. It's kind of confusing if I have a unique pointer to some handle that actually has multiple people using it. That seems confusing to me, at least. Ooh. Am I not advancing? There we go. OK. So. Um, at the time, and maybe less so now, one of your common style guidelines, you'd ask yourself, should I have a class that has both pure virtual methods and data members? And you can do it. The language doesn't stop you. But it starts to confuse your thinking about what classes mean. So there's, there's a little bit of a common-ish style where your types are either pure virtual. They say, here's my interface. And I tell you nothing about the implementation. I'm just saying, here's an interface we all agree to adhere to. And all of the implementations are completely hidden. They're only visible through smart pointers. Um, and the other thing you have is essentially plain old data type classes. I say POD-like because technically a POD class has no methods at all. But if they're just static methods that help you, or um, sorry, if they're just methods that help you manipulate things, but there's no virtual functions, it's essentially standard layout. And so we have this thing called delete pointer, which is essentially unique pointer. I'm not going to go into that one. But again, unique pointer didn't exist when we were starting to do this. So we wanted one that did the obvious thing. It deletes what's inside of it. It does exactly what you expect. But because we wrote it, we can add some safety belts. Like, I should never have a type inside a delete pointer that has a virtual function but doesn't have a virtual destructor. That's probably a bug. That's probably going to cause slicing. It's not guaranteed, so unique pointer can't statically assert that. But we own all of our code, so we can say, look, this is almost certainly a bug. Don't do it. There's some freedom you have in, when you implement all this stuff yourself. So and, and related to this, there's a question, is shared pointer thread safe? So this is um, Lewis Brandy gave a talk, like, I think, two years ago at CPPCon about curiously recurring bugs at Facebook. And the answer to, is shared pointer thread safe, is if you have to ask, the answer is no. Because, of course, the control block is totally thread safe. But what the shared pointer actually points to, there's no thread safety guarantees on that whatsoever. So if I have some type that is multiply owned, I should probably not expose regular data members as the actual interface type in shared pointer. Because if I've got some member that's just an int, and it's not const, I don't know what people are going to do with that. Are they going to use atomics when they modify it? I hope so, but I can't guarantee it. So 
there, you, can, you can continue on with this sort of API design idea to say, if I have some, if I have a class, it should be pure virtual, or you should just be plain old data that you look at and you have essentially value semantics. And if it's pure virtual, then I don't actually care how many owners of that underlying resource there are. The only way I can get at the type is through some virtual functions. And they really need to be thread safe because otherwise I'm exposing myself to problems. So I, as a consumer of a resource, I don't actually have to know anything about single or multiple ownership. I just have to know I own the resource and it's good until I say I'm done with it. And I have an API I can work with that's safe. And so if I have pure virtual inside of a smart pointer, I'm done. I, I have, I, I as the person constructing this system can ensure thread safety because I have forced you to talk to it only in certain ways. Um, for certain things, and so I want to be a little bit, um, every time I talk to people about programming domains, they have in their head a mental model of the stuff they work on. And I have in my head a mental model of the stuff I work on. And so it's quite possible that the things I'm saying make very little sense because they don't, they don't, they're not the problems you have in your domain. And so if some of this stuff feels um, confusing or otherwise, uh, uh, um, you're kind of wondering, what am I talking about? Please let me know. So once we move to a C++ 11 compiler, why don't we remove delete putter? And the short answer is it's got, um, I've got extremely minor advantages by making it myself. Um, I've got safety belts on virtual destructors. And I can remove a .get method because .get gives me back a raw pointer. And I really don't want to make it easy to get a raw pointer to something that someone else has ownership over because that makes it really, really easy to create lifetime issues. So um, let's go a little deeper into the kinds of things we're doing. So I've got some kind of asynchrony going on. So I've got, um, we deal with Flash, so I might have a thing called a Flash driver. And I have some virtual function called read, and I have a Flash, I have some kind of page that I'm going to read from. I'm going to read into a target buffer, and I need to fill in a result code. And similarly, I can, have, I can write, the uh, write the page, I can erase a block, and I'm going to have some other operations on Flash. And they're all going to be asynchronous in this sort of homegrown asynchronous framework because I don't, um, Again, it's 2010, we don't have very good asynchronous tools. Uh, we don't have coroutines. So I'm going to create some kind of asynchronous API. It's a request. It is disposable because the person who has a handle to this request owns it. They own the resource in some sense. And there's only one thing you can do with request is and say start. Start this piece of work. And you give it a functor to say, here's what you do when you're done. We don't actually use std function, but it's sort of the easiest thing to type. So we're going to implement coroutines manually uh, because it's the only thing we've got available. And so everything that you want to do that's async is going to be represented by this virtual API called a rec, which is just short for request. And so, and, and like with coroutines, uh, anytime you want to do something async, you can't wait synchronously for something else. So you have to, the thing underneath that has to be an async request. And the thing underneath that all the way down to essentially low level interrupts. And everything you build on top of a, an asynchronous thing has to itself be async because it's going to need to wait for one of these things. I think this will make more sense. I'm going to actually show an implementation of like how do I read Flash. Um, so we have like, I it was hard to count. I, I, uh, I we have somewhere between 500 and 1,000 different implementation classes for these async requests. Um, so I need a couple more APIs to show some example code. I've got a thing called a byte buffer. I have a, it's some representation of memory. You say, hey, I need a buffer for 16 kilobytes. You get ownership over that resource, and you can say what's the actual virtual address that I can use to read and write from, um, and I can trim it down. Um, and it seems a little bit silly, because why don't I just have like a pointer, or I could have a delete put or something. But there's a reason why I might want to trim the buffer, but still know what the original resource was. Um, and this is another one of those APIs that were indifferent about, but we have a lot of uses of, so it's hard to come up with something strictly better that we could refactor through API. So I've got these two things. So let's fill in a couple blanks. When I ask to read a page, I'm going to give you back an ownership over this request. And I'm going to tell you what page I want to read from. I'm going to give you a shallow reference to the buffer I want you to fill in. I'm going to fill out some kind of result for you. Um, and I need to give you that shallow reference to the byte buffer because, again, you're going to read data into this buffer, but maybe I don't know exactly how big it is on this piece of hardware. Maybe it's 16K exactly. Maybe it's 16256 bytes because, you know, different flash has different amounts of bits per page. And so I may not get exactly the same amounts of raw flashback. So I may want to give you the full byte buffer instead of just a window to memory because I want you to tell me, well, how much did you really fill in? 
Um, and similarly for, for uh, write and erase. Um, and the stuff in red is there because um, I'm giving you essentially raw access, a raw reference to a byte buffer, and a raw pointer to this result. Um, and for write, I can just pass an ownership of the buffer. As soon as you're done writing it, I'm, you know, the buffer can go away from my, from my standpoint because that was the whole point of the buffer was to write. So, but I had these raw pointers. And I want to get rid of those raw pointers because we just, show, you know, raw pointers are dangerous. I, can, I don't have any, I don't know of a clear ownership model for them. So, so what are these goals when I want to create a, other smart pointers? I want, to, I want to express ownership and non-ownership through the actual type system, right? I want the compiler to check these things for me. I want the auto cleanup of resources uh, like you get with shared putter, unique putter. And I want zero overhead for these non-owning pointers after optimization. This is, this is sort of the, the, the table stakes. I want to make it really hard to take ownership of a resource that I shouldn't own, right? Um, which I want to make it hard, so that, that creates double free or use after free types bugs. So this is the thing you can type in C++ today. You can make unique something, and then you can just pass the raw pointer into another unique putter, and oops, now I've got, now I'm going to re free this resource twice. You would not type this, right? Because you'd see that in your code and say, oh, well, that looks really fishy. But as code evolves, the, the, the clarity over ownership and, and release and where it was allocated and free gets further and further away, and it gets harder to tell who, who's supposed to do what. So, okay, so you probably wouldn't do that. But if I have a function that takes a raw pointer, um, should I delete it when I'm done? I mean, that's going to compile, right? But I don't know if that pointer actually expresses ownership or not. Um, and so you probably come up with some kind of standard like, well, all raw pointers are non-owning, which is great, but it's a lot harder when you're kind of slowly changing a code base where some pointers were owning because you didn't fully express everything through your smart pointers yet. So I want to actually have really clear semantics on who owns that. I want to say explicitly, yes, you own it or you don't own it. And I want to make it really hard to accidentally free the resource. OK, so you probably wouldn't, you might not do that. But OK, great, I got rid of my raw delete. So this code's better, right? I'm still taking ownership, though, of a thing I don't know if I should own. OK, so I'm not going to do that either. So maybe my function will take a, a reference to a unique putter and a shared putter and a bunch of other prototypes for all my other smart pointers. And then I can guarantee that this function knows it doesn't have ownership. It's got a const reference to a pointer, so it can't get rid of it itself. But that's a lot of prototypes, and that seems kind of silly. Um, using references doesn't really fix the problem. I mean, it's a little more obvious. Maybe I shouldn't you know, delete an ampersand reference or stuff a reference into a unique putter. Sorry, stuff the address of things of a thing from a raw reference into an unique putter. But it's, it's still possible to type it. It'll still compile. OK. Um, so in some sense, I kind of feel like you know, uh, dot .get is a, was a bad idea, perhaps. But I understand where it comes from, right? If, you, if you're in a world that has no smart pointers, you're going to have lots of places where you need to give a raw pointer to somebody. And you hope that everyone understands the ownership model. Um, I, as a person who is effectively writing a library for the people at work or working with the library for people at work, I have a little more flexibility. There is this um, C++ 20 thing called std pointer traits to address. I think that's meant for fancy pointers, to take a fancy pointer and get some kind of thing that I can actually dereference using loads and stores. Um, and frankly, to address isn't a scary enough name for, for me to think, oops, I might be violating ownership ideas here. So the second goal here is it should be really easy to construct a non-owning pointer from an owning pointer, right? If I've got somebody who owns it, I should be able to pass a view to somebody else. And it's trivial in, it's trivial to be using the dereference operator to get a reference, to get then a plain reference to something, but that isn't 100% clear in ownership. So I'd like to be even more clear than that. Um, so I really want to eliminate raw pointers. Like I said, your convention that raw pointers are non-oding is still problematic because you can still accidentally do things with them you didn't want to do. Um, and I really want to, I want to make it as hard as possible to type code that's buggy. Um, and that kind of means I actually want to eliminate raw references. So const references are safe. You can't delete a const reference or the address of the thing. You can't stuff a const reference into an eek putter. Um, there's other reasons I kind of want to eliminate references from at least from my code base. Uh, so, I came from a C background. I had like uh, 13 plus years working experience working in C before I ever started working on C++. Some of the developers we hire also have C backgrounds. They're not yet used to C++. For those developers seeing, you know, foo.bar, they, their mental model is, well, that's dot in the C world. That means the memory is all contiguous. It's just a member of the struct. But if it's a reference, it's actually, actually if that, it, 
if bar is a reference member, then that dot is actually a pointer dereference. It could be a cache miss. Um, it might be a lifetime issue. Um, when I call a function, if I just pass what looks like a value, but the function takes things by reference, it could modify the parameter. And again, from a C++ programmer standpoint, that's fine. You're probably used to thinking about that. You'll check the function prototype. When you're debugging, you'll to make sure that, oops, this thing may or may not have been modified by the call to the function. But as a C programmer, you don't think about that. And even as a C++ programmer, you may forget about it. So I would really love it if I could come up with a system where I could pass ampersand foo to a function to make it clear this thing could be modified by the function call. It makes my debugging easier. I get to do more local reasoning about what's going on. Um, so let's start thinking about names. If I don't own a resource, then I'm borrowing the resource. Um, this borrowed view is only good for the context of your stack frame. If I pass a borrowed into a function, since you don't own the resource, you either need to use it in the stack or make a copy of it or do something else to preserve the lifetime, which is the same semantic you should have with a reference. Um, if there are reasons to want to say, well, I've got a shallow view, but I know the view lasts longer than this operation, um, that's the kind of thing you should really clearly document on your API. For performance reasons, you definitely want to make copies everywhere. But you, um, you typically, you at least want to rep represent that, um, the ownership. So everything that's got a lifetime on it is either owned or borrowed. I have some non-ownership use cases. Um, these are for out parameters. Um, until recently, I thought I only needed these because um, I'm dealing with, uh, I'm essentially manually implementing coroutines. So to manually implement a coroutine, when I say I want you to fill in my buffer or my result code or something, I have to give you essentially the memory to fill in, and the function is actually going to return this async, this uh, memory object representing the asynchronous work. So I have, because I can't return the value to you because I don't have coroutines and I have to go async, I, I have to return to you the thing that knows how to do async work, and you tell me what memory do I fill in when it's done. Um, it turns out, it seems like um, after having just listened to the executor's talk, there is a desire to continue actually having things pushed into functions rather than just, um, rather than always being return values. So this may actually make more sense, continue to make sense uh, even in a coroutine world. Um, so I've got borrowed. So this expresses a lack of ownership. It's a non-owning pointer. It's got your dereference operator and your um, whatever you call the operator arrow. Um, and it turns out after having worked with so borrowed existed at the code base I was working on when I started there. But after having worked with it for a while, I kind of wanted something, um, I'm calling it reference semantics. I think that's not the right word. But I want this idea that I can construct this non-owning pointer. I have to give it a value when I construct it, as opposed to not, as opposed to leaving it uninitialized. And I also want this idea that I can't override it once I set it. There, that, that's a useful semantic of references, that they have to actually have a real value in them that's never null, and you can't change what they point to. You, can cha you cannot change. Essentially, since the reference is a pointer under the covers, you can't change the pointer. It's effectively a const pointer, not a pointer to const, but a const pointer. So I want that kind of same semantic for my smart pointer. Um, but I actually had some sense I had two choices. This thing could be assigned to or not, meaning I could overwrite what it points to, and it could be null or not. Um, so there might be needs for these like non-assignable but optionals, or assignable but never null. But um, they haven't come up much. Most of the times, I want either it's optional and I can change what it points to or it's non-optional and it's going to stay the way same forever. Um, the name borrowed already existed, so I didn't get to name it borrowed putter. I don't know. They're naming things is really hard. Um, and in a sense, also, because I own all this code, I own borrowed and I own owed, I could write some debug code inside owned that gives me some extra memory that essentially knows all of the borrowed that point to it or something like that. Some, or something like having a shared put or so and a weak put or in the borrowed. And so when, every time you use a borrowed, I could actually write code that says, is the thing I'm pointing to still valid? This is another advantage of owning your own code in a way. You can, you can write these debug functionality that, um, that don't exist in the standard. Um, I haven't written this. Probably ASAN is better for that use case, but it's still a possibility. So the other smart pointer I want, I'm calling out. Um, I originally wanted to name it out param. And then you know my coworker said, well, that's a lot of letters. I already know it's a parameter. Why bother? So we actually have this in the code base. I introduced this this year. The idea behind out is it represents some kind of out parameter. It's something that will be filled in either synchronously in the context of the function or asynchronously when this asynchronous work blob completes. And so I, I have some slightly different expectation of the lifetime of an out. If you tell me, I want you asynchronously to fill in some memory for me, because that's the job I'm going to do, and I know it's going to go async. 
It doesn't really make any sense to yank away the memory that I told you to fill in until you've actually finished the job. So even though this is a pointer to something that somebody else owns, and it's a shallow pointer, I have a different expectation of lifetime than I do with borrowed, which is why I have a different name for it. Um, some parameters are optional, so I have another name, out opt. Um, and I want the use of this out parameter to look identical to a raw pointer. I want to say ampersand foo at the call site, because I, as a coming from a C background or working with C programmers, that's more familiar to them. It's a little more obvious at the call site what's going on. Um, this ends up being unrelated to this thing called outputter, which is being proposed for standardization. So naming things is hard. I wouldn't necessarily propose standardizing these names, but it's what we've got to work with um, right now. So if I put these things together, what I had before was I, you know, I took a byte buffer by reference and a command result, some kind of result type by pointer because I'm filling it in. And my calling code would look like I'd say read. I have some flash driver and say read. Here's the address. Here's the target buffer. Fill in this result. Um, and if I just change them to represent ownership, the callers essentially stay the same. But now, I've, now I know exactly what the lifetime of all of these things should be. So I think what I, wanted to, what I was going to do next is walk through some implementation details of what exactly, how exactly do I make, how exactly do I implement borrowed and owned and out. Um, are there any questions on the, the intent of the API? This is kind of making sense. Okay. So um, I was going to breeze through this a little bit because I can always come back later. Um, there's a little bit of fun stuff in this because you get to do some, both some Sphene and some static asserts on th some things. So I have this idea that I want a reference or a pointer semantic on this borrowed and this out object. And so I can f I'm going to forward declare some things. I've got an owned, which takes something that's probably disposable, but you could put anything you want. I've got a borrowed, which defaults to pointer, but you can make it a reference using, oh, it screw fell off, fell off the bottom. Who oh, knows? Let's try just a sec. Oh, this looked so good in sheets, it did not fall off the bottom of the page. Oh, so sad. Give me. Zoom out and keep it in windowed mode for a Oh, yeah. I could, well, let's see. Can I, um, if I do that and I do that? Nope. Okay. All right. Well, so here, let me. No, it's actually really gone. <laughs> oh, I see. These things fell off the side of the edge. There, it's not, this window is not as wide as the window I had it in originally. How hilarious. Um, my apologies for the technical difficulties. Let's go to the source. And I guess I have to figure something out before I put these slides up wherever I'm supposed to put the slides. Come on. And, uh, okay, here we go. See about that. There we go. Now it fits on my screen. Okay. So I've got some I've got some aliases. You know, out is a it's this I, I named it param pointer because I needed some slightly longer name. So out is this parameter kind of pointer, but it's got reference semantics. In out's exactly the same thing, but it gives me some documentation that maybe I'm going to read from it and write to it. Um, out opt gives me pointer semantics, and that's that's just sort of forward declaring things. So, like for own, right? I have to delete the copy constructor. I've got I can construct it with null by default. I take ownership of things on move on move construct. These are all really um, that this is exactly what you would expect essentially. There's something we can do that's a little bit fun because we own it ourselves. I can make a constructor for owned that takes a raw pointer. And I want to do that, right? I want to be able to explicitly say, hey, this raw pointer, some, you actually really have ownership of it. Um, and I want to do that explicitly because I don't want to accidentally take ownership of a raw pointer. So if, if I, I don't want to accidentally implicitly convert from raw pointer to somehow owning. But it turns out you can actually specialize on a const reference to a pointer and a R value reference to a pointer. And so I can actually make an implicit constructor for my ownership model. So if I have a, if I have an R value raw pointer that is supposed to be owned by somebody, that it has some kind of ownership semantic with it, if I don't implicitly convert it to owned, that's a memory leak. And so it ends up meaning that, um, so I don't have things like make owned in my code base because um, there's some, it's, it didn't add a lot for us. But so I end, up making, I end up making a lot of owns just by saying new foo. I just, I have a lot of news in my code base, but I don't have raw pointers. So 
Uh, in some sense, I think if your mental model was new, don't say raw, new, and delete, that's mostly true. But I think what it was really meaning, uh, or at least the thing I experienced having done this, is what you really want to say is don't have raw pointers sitting around and don't use raw deletes. But raw news are okay as long as someone's going to take ownership. So I have, in my implementation of the read function, I can just new up an actual instantiation of a request. And I can just return it as an R value reference to a raw pointer, and it gets con converted automatically into an ownership model for me. So I don't have to explicitly, as long as the return type's good, I don't have to explicitly say, well, this has to be owned, because it's, the return type makes it happen for me, um, which is kind of convenient in your source code. Uh, that R value reference to a pointer is not 100% safe, because if someone stood moves a raw pointer, you now have an R value reference to it. Oops. People don't type that too often. It hasn't been much of an issue. These things are pretty. Um, common, my operator arrow returns the pointer, operator star returns star p. I've got some asserts that it's not null because you shouldn't be doing that if it's null. You're probably going to trip up against it soon. Uh, I've got an operator bool like you'd expect. Always make your bool operator bools explicit. If this is a thing you didn't know, you should really know that. Um, if I have an implicit operator bool, if I just tape operator bool and I do a thing, and I try to compare two objects, and I didn't already write a comparison function for them, them in some way, the compiler will say, well, I don't know how to compare these two things, but I can implicitly convert them in one step to some other type that has a comparison operation. And so my two smart point, if I had an implicit operator bool, I would have smart pointers look like they're the same that, that aren't, simply because they're both non-null. So they both have an implicit operator bool that said true, and now true looks like it's equal to true. Um, that was a thing that bit us once in one of our cases. And so, you know, operator uh, assignment is relatively common, you know, you have to do a little bit of funny business in case it's self-assignment um, so that you don't do something horrible. But all of these are kind of standard. And so then the, the interest, the sort of the interesting thing is what do I do now? I've got some of these standard operations and I, I wanted to show them for completeness. How do I avoid dot .get? Right? This is your norm, standard standard pointers have a dot .get function which gives you the raw pointer and I don't want that. Um, we dithered over names for a while, but the thing we came up with was this horrible looking thing that said called raw pointer ignoring lifetime. And the thing I love about that name is it's long enough to type that you feel bad typing it, and it tells you exactly what it's doing. I'm explicitly subverting an ownership model. So I, I forward declare the function so that I can actually make it a friend inside my um, smart pointers, and then I can have default implementations for unique pointer and shared pointer for those just return the underlying raw pointer. And so now I, can, I never have to implement a .get operator on my smart pointers, but I can still get back the raw pointer for the few cases you need it. But now it, looks, I can always, now it looks like a code smell every time I see it. There are other ways to get a raw pointer. I can say ampersand star. That probably should feel like a code smell too. That's not a thing you type too often. When I see a bunch of symbols mashed together, I start wondering if I'm doing something wrong. You can explicitly call operator arrow paren paren and not just use the dereference operator. But that, would also, that should also make me twitchy if I see that in code. So, I've now, I mean, like I said, nothing, none of this is perfect. You can always get a raw pointer back, and you have to be able to get a raw pointer back from these things to make the, to make the system work. You can't, you essentially can't effectively implement the dereference operator without giving somebody the ability to get a raw pointer. But I've made it harder, and I've made it more obvious when I do it. Um, some semi-obvious constructors for borrowed. The, the nice thing about borrowed is I can, um, so for borrowed, I don't want it to ever be null if it's supposed to have reference semantics, so I can statically assert that. If somebody tries to create a borrowed ref and they don't give it a value, it won't even compile. Um, if somebody, uh, and I can always create, a, essentially I can effectively always create a borrowed from a smart pointer just by asking for the raw pointer and ignoring lifetime. Because in this case, it's okay to ignore lifetime. I'm explicitly showing a, a non-ownership. Um, and there's some sphene in there to say it must be a smart pointer type. Uh, PS requires is a semi-obvious macro that does uh, stood enable if. It turns out making it a macro is nice because for one thing I can just kind of make it a contract or sorry a um, concept requirement later. And the other advantage is it turns out that um, there's more than one way to say um, std enable if like you can say like type name equals st std enable if thing and you get a void or nothing. That con that way of doing sphene doesn't work in some contexts uh, where the functions look equivalent otherwise. Um, I, I don't remember the exact example, but it turns out there is one way that always works, which is to say int equals um, blah, 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 type name zero. Um, you end up, you end up that, that kind of sphene always works. So I can now avoid, I can only, uh, now I can, essentially I can construct a borrowed from any kind of other pointer as long as it's something that I thought was a smart pointer. Um, 
The only other thing that's a little bit interesting, when I want to copy or move a borrowed, I want to, I want to not allow you to take a thing that is definitely, that may be null, and stuff it into a thing that is definitely not null. So I, want you, I don't want you to take this optional type borrowed and be able to put it in a borrowed ref just by, assign, just by constructing it. I want to force you to use the dereference operator. And I can do that by statically asserting on the types. Um, similarly, for borrowed, I want to, um, I can take raw pointers. It is probably a bug to take, owner, to take a borrowed of an R value pointer, because now I've got a memory leak again. But you can do it explicitly if you really want to. Um, <coughs> param putter has some kind of similar ones. I want to, I want to, sorry, I should not make a borrowed from a param putter because they mean different things. Some of this, I mean, I don't, I don't expect this to be super exciting. I want it to be here for completeness. Um, I want to make it impossible to make a borrowed from an R value smart pointer because I'm saying stood move this thing somewhere else. And I'm actually not taking ownership of it anymore. I'm taking a shallow view of it. And that's probably going to cause a lifetime issue. Uh, I, I don't remember. Um, I don't remember why, but I wrote that code without explicit. I just assumed I shouldn't, I didn't need explicit. And it turns out there are contexts where you could have an R value pointer that goes into a borrowed and doesn't do what you want. So it turned out the explicit was needed. We wrote some exciting unit tests that don't work. Um, well, they don't work if you uh, uncomment the code that shouldn't work. And it turns out actually there's, um, we haven't explored this yet because we're still on C++ 11, but there is a way to write a static assert that this blob of code should not compile using SVNA and C++14. One of my coworkers has it all worked out. Um, and maybe I will show that in a lightning talk someday when we actually have it done and working. But it is technically possible in C++14 to statically assert that a piece of code can't compi doesn't compile, which is super cool if I want to be able to say, look, this kind of ownership transfer that's a misuse of ownership, I don't want that to work. Um, you have some comparison operations. Um, Free function overloads for equals and not equals based on those. Um, because I own this, I can do slightly annoying things like saying I don't want to generalize comparison. I don't want to be able to say is this pointer less than this other pointer. Um, the, the stock C++ smart pointers let you do that. And it's not impossible that there's a valid reason for that. So as a, as a, uh, as a committee member, I wouldn't ever say, well, I can't have an operator less than on my two smart pointers. I can compare two raw pointers. I should probably, for, for, any, for um, one being less than the other, I should probably do it for my smart pointers. But at the same time, the two things represent a completely different memory allocation. They're either equal or not equal. But where one comes before the other in some kind of ordering is not a question I should want to ask. And I'm not saying it's impossible there aren't contexts for this. But again, the nice thing about me being a library implementer, essentially, for local code is I can say, don't do this. And when somebody runs across their code not compiling, they're going to ask me, hey, how do I do this? What's the question? Sorry, good one. A natural usage would be a locking context. A locking context. Ah, I see. Um, true. A natural usage of this would be in a locking context. So you can order locks. Um, for us, that doesn't end up mattering because all of our code is lock free. Because uh, since we have a thread model where we have a, th a thread pool, taking a lock on one thread in a thread pool can starve the system. So everything we do has to be lock free. But you're right. That would be a good use. <coughs> um, and there's some std common type stuff. That to make to, to to figure out like how do I compare raw pointers and borrowed? Um, I think at the time we did a bunch of overloads for equality operations. Stood common type might have just worked, uh, but I didn't actually know about it at the time we wrote some of that code. You learn new things all the time. Um, Fram is kind of similar to borrowed, so I don't really want to go into it, but it exists for completeness. Um, you also can't convert from optional to mandatory pointers. There's some other operations. So Fram pointer has is even simpler than a borrowed. I can't assign to a param pointer in, in, in the sense that um, if I'm saying this represents a parameter, I can construct it because I need to take it as a parameter. I might need to store it as a class member because I'm implementing all this async stuff myself. But I never want to overwrite it because you've already told me what memory to fill in. I should never change that. So it's not even the, the, operat the operators don't even exist. I can implicitly convert from a param pointer back to a raw pointer because I have, um, I want to say, on the order of 10,000 or more raw pointers in the system, most of which are representing some parameter to be filled in by an asynchronous operation. I can't convert all of them to from a raw pointer to this out smart pointer at once. And so I have to be able to convert small pieces of code at a time. So by implicitly allowing 
going back to a raw pointer, I can say, look, I have a pram pointer that came to me. I'm going to pass it on down to you, and you're just going to see it as a raw pointer for now, and someday I'll go and fix that. Um, so let's go and actually implement something with all of this. So I've got this base concept of disposable, um, but I don't want to have to implement dispose all the time, doing the same thing all the time. I most of the time, when I want to dispose of a resource, I probably did just want to delete it. So I can have a helper, a CRTP type helper. I tell you my implementation type and my interface type. So here's another thing about our code base. I, I couldn't think, I honestly couldn't think of better names for these things. Um, so a lot of places we have, here's our implementation type, that's impl underscore t. And they have an interface type, ITFT. And they're, they look like gibberish until you read it for a while. And then you're just kind of like, yeah, that's an interface type. Because um, otherwise it's like NET, I can use T and U, but I don't really don't like one letter names. They're hard to read too. So anyway, um, I have a CRTP helper. You tell me what your base type, what the actual concrete type is, and you tell me the interface you want it to look like, which defaults to disposable. And I can make you, um, and then I can just implement dispose. Dispose will call, will call cast like CRTP. Dispose will cast your pointer into the actual implementation type, and it calls this um, this uh, regular member function disposable dispose, which by default just says delete this. Which um, my recollection is saying delete this is slightly dodgy in that in theory the compiler could move some code around and you access members after the delete. In practice, this has always worked for us on Clang GCC and my uh, MSVC. So I'm not 100% sure that that's actually standards compliant, but it practically works and I hope someone doesn't break it. Um, so, because like, like I say, the default behavior I want, if I have ownership of something, probably most of the time I just nude it up and I want to delete it. But I may have other things I want to do. And I'll show an example of that. So hand waving a little bit of stuff. This is, you know, still slideware. This is essentially how I would implement reading from Flash. My request, my actual implementation type, Flash read rec, is inherits from disposable base because I just want the default behavior of deleting myself. And my, my interface type is rec because I need the rec interface, not just the disposable interface. I've got some class members. Maybe I've got a, uh, this flash driver implementation that th that's a parent that holds some other things for me. I'm going to hold on to the flash page you want. I'm going to hold on to your buffer. That was a borrowed ref. I'm going to hold on to your result. That was an out. I need to hold on to this completion function you're going to tell me when you start. And I've got a couple other member variables for doing the work. I'm going to, in order to read from flash, I actually need a DMA address for the FPGA to talk to. I'm going to, if I'm talking to the FPGA, I need a command slot because the FPGA can only run so many things at once. So, so in our system, this is, there's some other steps I'm going to have to have. And so I've got these, um, these member functions. This, this start is required by the rec interface. Everyone, anyone who uses a request just says, all I know how to do is start you and tell you what to do when you're done. And everything else is steps that will happen along the way of actually running the code. So the first thing I do on start is I hold on to your, um, hold on to your completion function. Um, I'm, again, I'm hand waving here. We don't use the function. I'd probably do this by r value ref and move. I don't know, uh, but this isn't actually a std function. Um, it's a different way of expressing a continuation. And then I say, look, I need to get a DMA address. I have a buffer. I can get a virtual address for it, and I know how. And I have some other service that can take virtual addresses and convert them into DMA addresses. So I'm going to say, great, give me a DMA address. And then I'm going to say, okay. That also that returned me a, a rec or an owned rec because again this is something that may take may have to go async to get its job done. I may have a limited pool of DMA memory available, and so maybe I can give you a DMA, DMA address now, but maybe I have to wait for enough uh, uh, essentially physical addresses for my IO MMU to become available. So I check to see if I have an, uh, anything there, and if I is, I say great, run the request, enter a start, and call notify DMA adder when you're done. And if there was no if I didn't have any work to do, if I already have a DM address, directly call the function. Well, this is boilerplate that comes up a lot, so let's just make a helper for that. I'm going to call this member function, and it goes through a template in order to get you um, fixed size. So a pointer to member function is not a fixed size pointer, but if you go through a template and you do some goop, which I have in the appendix, you can get a fixed size pointer out of it. And this is actually how we store our continuations. So I'm going to say, great, I have this thing that may or may not be null. I'm going to say, call this function when the request is done. So when I've been notified I have a DMA address, the next thing I need to do is allocate an FPGA command slot. So I do the same thing. I ask my parent, it's got a service that knows about command slots. I get, a, I get an optional possibly request and I say, great, when that thing finishes, call notify command slot. When it's done, this member variable, which I told the 
function about will be filled in with the actual thing. So I can say, great, my parent has some kind of completion table, and I will fill in at my slot wh who I am, so that when the actual interrupt comes in for that command slot, it can find me and call my completion function. And this is really low-level code. Most of our uh, async requests don't look quite this complicated, but this gets at some of the, real, the interesting details. I'm reusing the memory for that inner member. It's just an owned rec. I can assign into it 20 times in the process of doing my job because I have a bunch of async steps that I have to do to get it done. So once I have the command slot, I tell the parent where my thing is. I translate the flash address into something that the FPGA understands, and I fill in some FPGA registers. And the moment I fill in those FPGA registers, I could get a, sync, a completion on a different thread because there's some thread running in the background looking for completed uh, hardware interrupt completions. And when I get that, the, again, we wrote, all the, we wrote all the code so we know what to do. When I get that, I say, great, a completion came out on this slot. I have a table that tells me what request was there. So I'm going to say, great, um, call this function notify done and tell it the result of the read. So I can release my FPGA command slot. In reality, I probably want that to be some kind of um, RAII type so I don't have to accidentally forget. I can reset my inner member so that I can release um, any other associated memory. I can fill in the result based on the hardware code, and I can trim the buffer down to the size I wanted, and then I can call the oncomplete method. And so from the standpoint of the consumer who wanted to read Flash, they said, read me some Flash, and here's the function you should call when you're done. And they just return from their stack frame. They're done. And somewhere later on some other thread, at some point later, we come in and call you and say, hey, I'm done. Um, and so, so a lot of this stuff doesn't relate to ownership, but it strongly relates to the programming model where I use these borrowed references and these owns and things like that and these out parameters. So to actually new up one of these things, I just fill in the parameters. Um, this is all hand wave, like I said. There's, but it's, I can do other allocation strategies, right? So for example, and, and I don't have to change the caller. The caller doesn't change if I change the implementation here of this read function. The caller just has a request. When this completed, they, they, they reset their smart pointer, which says dispose. So I could say, great. Um, I happen to know that further up, I've already gone and synchronized myself based on the uh, flash LUN I'm going to write to. The hardware itself, the NAND, only allows one command per LUN. So somewhere in my stack, I have to synchronize on that. So if I know I'm already synchronized, I could just pre-allocate one of these flash read recs for every single LUN. And so then I just have to take the address that I'm given, turn it into some kind of linear index, and find this reserved request and fill it in. And I initialize it and I return it. And the disposable dispose, I'm, and then maybe I have some debugging, like I check to see if it's a, a free slot so I can check to make sure I didn't actually reuse it twice. The caller of this doesn't change at all. It's just the implementation that changed. And so now I'm not deleting anything in disposable dispose. I'm just doing nothing. It was pre-allocated to Martin in the slot. All I have to do is set, set some debugging state to make sure that we're not doing something stupid. Could have a different allocation strategy. Maybe I have an atomic stack of these things. And so I can say, hey, is it empty? Um, actually, I think I just have to call it. This is a little bit funny because it's atomic. I think I wrote this wrong. I can say basically pop. And if pop returns me non-null, great. Um, I can reuse one of these things. And so I can reinitialize it. Otherwise, I allocate a new one. And then I just return it. Um, and, and in this allocation strategy, then I have to, then maybe I check. There's two different kinds of return allocation strategies here. In one allocation strategy, if, um, if I have too many things in my stack, if I'm holding on to too much cached memory, I just delete it like because it was regular allocated memory. Otherwise, I push it in for, for later use. And so again, the caller didn't change. They don't know anything about how I'm allocating or freeing memory. All they know is they asked me to do something. And so I've got an allocation strategy that lets me hold on to, in this case, roughly 30 cached objects for reuse. Similarly, I could just decide to pre-allocate some number. And if it was a pre-allocated one, I push it back in the stack. Otherwise, I delete it. There, both of the, none of that changes the caller. So in some sense, I didn't show the calling code much because the calling code never changed. All they knew is they had ownership of this asynchronous request. And I can do lots of different things inside. And I don't have to change the return type. So if the return type had been a unique putter, I would have to change the return. The return type would have to have some kind of deleter that I filled in every time I allocate with a different function to, to, to handle delete. And I probably don't have to change the templated return type as long as I fill in a different instance of the releasing function. 
But I still have to, I can't just return you a std unique pointer. I have to return you a std unique pointer, comma, some kind of function object that knows how to release the resource. And so my return type gets kind of gory and possibly changes the return type when I change the allocation strategy. By, knowing, by, by only knowing that this resource now is how to release itself, I don't have to think about that anymore. Um, I think I'm going to skip some of this stuff. It's here for completeness. So I can make multiple ownership happen. I can create a reference counter. Um, it's just an atomic of uint32 that lets me increment and decrement. Um, you know, when I want to try, when I'd want to try to get a reference, I see has it gone has it gone too high? Maybe I have a limit so I can detect underflow. If don't I don't allow increment from zero because once it's gone to zero, the object probably should be freed. Um, and so I can try to get a reference. And then if I really want a reference, I just assert it succeeds. On dereference, I subtract and I checked I didn't underflow and things like that. Um, there's some fiddly bits about when you need what kind of memory orderings you need on these things. The, what I do with that then is I can say, look, I've got, I had this concept disposable. I have a similar concept refable. All refable says is, again, there's an ownership model and I know how to make more references. And unfortunately, um, I, can't I have to return you a raw pointer from this base refable class because there's no, I can't override a function named ref that used to return an own, uh, uh, for a covariant return type, that covariant return types work on raw pointers, but not on smart pointers, basically. So I have to have this raw thing that says, don't call me directly, I've got a mix in. The mix in kind of does what you might expect, it just calls the underlying thing. Um, again, this is all for completeness. So again, I can, like, just like disposable base, I can have a refable base. Um, I know how to create new things um, uh, using this latched reference counter. So doing, using the latch reference counter, I increment and I return myself. On dispose, I say, did I decrement to zero? If so, great, I'm done. I'm going to call the CRT function that says I'm done with it. The default behavior is to delete it, but I can override it, again, to put it back in a recycling pool or something else. <coughs> so now I have a, a, a smart pointer type that knows how to mul be multiply owned. So maybe my byte buffers actually have multiple ownership. And nothing changed except it's refable instead of disposable. And so what that allows me to do, um, you know, when I call read, I just pass it a gesture. Uh, when I call read, everything looks the same. Read and write look the same. I pass in ownership. Um, if I want to pass in the same buffer to multiple calls to write, I just ref the buffer along the way. And the same memory is being used. I've just got an updated reference count. And so again, um, you know, you could do kind of the same thing with shared putter, but if I want to change from single to multiple ownership, I have to change my type. It went from unique putter to shared putter, and I still maybe need custom deletion functions. And with this own smart point, I don't have to do any of that. Um, so if I want to do a mirrored write, like, you know, I'm a, I'm a flash system. Sometimes we, instead of doing RAID, we do mirroring. So if I want to do a mirrored write, I know these flash addresses from my mirrors, so I have to have some results. Got this, I'm going to hand wave what a rec is. It's is. It's essentially a vector of recs. Um, and so for each mirror in the mirrors, I'm going to create a result, pass in the address of that result. And since I reserved all these addresses are good, I'm just going to ref the buffer. And so now I can write the same buffer to three different flash addresses. And I didn't have to change much code at all. Like I now I've got this rec that knows how to get um, get out a, a single rec that knows how to start all the inner ones, and I just start them all up. And, and again, when I changed my ownership model a little bit, I didn't really have to change any of the consumers, which I think is a kind of a nice thing to think about. So, right, when I look at a member variable and I see owned byte buffer, is that instance singly owned? Or is it multiply owned? When I see an owned foo, where foo is some type I haven't talked about yet, is that singly owned or multiply owned? I mean, I might know if foo inherited from disposable, or sorry, from refable, and I can make more refs of it myself. But all I really know is that foo has some lifetime control. It's in a smart pointer, and I have some ownership over it right now. If I see an owned without a type in it, is that singly or multiply owned? I don't know anything about what's inside of it. I just know I own that thing until I reset it. So I have. Why, the, the, in some sense, the fundamental question is, why do I want to know if these things have single or multiple ownership? Um, I, as a user of a smart pointer or of a class, if I have to think about whether it's singly or multiply owned, and I have to do things about multiple ownership, 
I've owed myself up to creating bugs. So by not thinking about how many people could own this resource, which shared putter and unique putter, they enforce in the type system, we have to think about, in one case I know or I think I know it's uniquely owned, in the other case I think it might be multiply owned. By not having that in a type system, I don't think about it anymore. So that, like this byte buffer case is kind of complex because I've got this idea that I'm going to read into the memory it represents. And if I have multiple copies of it, I don't want multiple readers reading from different places and reading different data. So there is, there is still some issues there to think about. But in general, it's kind of nice that I, I think less about who owns what and how many things they own. I just know I still own it. Um, I'm going to hand wave through a little bit of this stuff too. Um, I can make this underlying type called cancel binding. Um, it gives, you just give it a function that you want to run when somebody calls cancel, when you want to cancel it. It looks like a disposable. Um, and what I can do with that then is I can decide, hey, this read request down to the flash, um, maybe I want to cancel it if it takes too long or do something else if it takes too long. I want to read from different flash and do a RAID reconstruct. So all I have to do to make that happen, I don't have to change much at all. The implementation becomes refable, uh, which is one way to handle the fact that I have a, I'm handing out essentially two references to this memory. One is the actual underlying read request and the other is this cancellation binding. So the constructor takes all the original parameters and just one extra parameter, which is an optional out of this owned that I'm going to fill in. And if you told me you wanted a cancel binding, then I'm going I'm to run this function if somebody decides to cancel. I'm going to um, take an extra reference inside. I'm going to call a member function called do cancel, and I'm going to early dispose my extra, my extra reference to the memory underlying this request. And the consumer then, they used to have a rack inner that they were going to say read. Now they just have an extra plain owned that they pass in to be filled in. And now instead of just saying read, you know, run the request, I can say, I can have this, um, again, I'm going to hand wave what this looks like, this timeout race rec new. So I say, I want you to run this request, and I want you to do this thing when it, if the timeout fires, and I'm going to give you a 10 millisecond buffer. If I can't get data back from the flash in 10 milliseconds, the flash has gone out to lunch, I need to do something else. And so when I start it, so here's where I hand wave the continuation didn't take any operations. It actually has to take some kind of error code to let me know that I canceled it. So if I time out, then my completion function is going to see a non-null error. So I'll call, I'll call whatever the caller wanted to do, but I'll tell them, hey, you got an error. Otherwise, I'll just say, great, I got my data. And again, I realize I'm hand-waving a whole lot of stuff here, but I hope this kind of makes sense. So this cancellation binding, it looks like any other own resource. Um, and it's calling arbitrary code through virtual dispatch. Uh, but because it's, this, um, it, because it's an ownership type, I can't forget to reset it. Eventually, the person who wanted to read from Flash and also had this cancellation binding, eventually both of those things are going to re get reset when that whole object goes away. And I could expose some other kind of handle for this cancellation, but um, whatever handle I expose still needs to always happen because the, the whole idea behind a asynchronous request that could be canceled is that I have to have, underlying it, I have to have some kind of multiple ownership. I can't if I reset the can if I say, hey, I want to cancel you, and I reset that kind of ownership, the underlying memory for the request can't go away because the request could be synchronously completing on a different thread. And so I have to have both the request, this owned rack, and this cancellation binding both have some kind of ownership of the underlying resource. But from the consumer's standpoint, they don't know any of that. All they know is they have a handle to say, please cancel, and they have a different handle to say, this is the running request right now. And so this owned, it's convenient, because I have to have some kind of ownership, but it's also not really a lie. I mean, I had to have underlying ownership of that memory. So that's essentially what I wanted to talk about. Um, the, 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 night, the thing you get with this, in a way, is I don't have to talk about what happens when I reset the smart pointer. Um, I mean, you can certainly do that using unique putter, but the, the, the name of the type actually changes. And you can make a using alias for it so that you can hide that. But under, under the covers, you still had to do something. And if I didn't have a using alias originally, and I wanted to change something about my ownership model, I have to change every single caller who used to say unique putter to say unique putter of foo comma something. And, and you can ask, the question you want to ask is, why do I, as this consumer of the smart pointer, why do I want to know what the type of the deleter is? I shouldn't have to care because it, it, what happens at delete is not my problem. It's the underlying resources problem. All I know is I own the resource, 
I have a handle to it, and at some point it'll go away. Um, and using a custom deleter that wants to do something stateful is an extra mouthful at initialization time. You have to pass an instance in when you're creating your unique putter instance. Um, it, makes your delete put, it makes your unique putter also 16 bytes instead because it's got a stateful instance inside it. Um, and because I'm specifying this deleter instance separately, it's possible I'll get it wrong. It's not too likely. I mean, I'm still allocating something, and I kind of know how I allocate it, so I know how I want to free it. But in a code refactoring, they can get displaced from each other. This disposable thing always knows how to delete itself. Um, and the implementation are in, this implementation already had to know anyway, because um, uh, I had to allocate it, and it, and it had to know how it was, how, how was going to be cons consumed through lifetime. And if your ownership changes to shared ownership, you have to do this rototilly of your code base for unique to shared. And, um, and like I say, I think in some sense, the central thesis is I, as a consumer of a managed resource, shouldn't have to know much about its ownership model. I should just know that I have a handle to a point, a handle to a resource. And I can use that handle until I say I'm done with it. Um, so and none of this is really game changing, right? You could type all of this stuff. And maybe if you did it right at the beginning, and maybe this stuff doesn't change too often, single to multiple ownership, custom deleters, et cetera. But um, you still have to think about it a little bit because it's all encoded in the type system. Owned at least doesn't encode anything in the type system. It, well, it encodes in the type system in a different way by saying I'm, I have a member function called dispose, and I do that instead of something else. And in some sense, this is an advantage of um, you're designing your code base for private use. I can, I can decide that some use cases don't matter to me at all. Um, I can say, look, I'm never going to do that because it doesn't fit with my model. And a standard committee doesn't get that luxury. They have to solve for everybody. And if for, you know, even in our code base, unique protocol will still have a place for like a safe wrap around file stars or things like that. But um, if, I had to have, if I had to have a virtual destructor because I had virtual functions and I needed that for slicing issues, I might as well, and from my standpoint in our code base, if I have to have a virtual destructor, I might as well inhead, instead just inherit from disposable because then I can do more things than just destroy myself in order to release my own memory. Um, and so this ends up meaning that there's not much space in our code base for our use cases to actually use the standards unique or shared pointer. Um, there's a little bit of a... Uh, you know, question, if you're implementing a system sort of from the ground up, um, and system software is kind of a special case. Like, I have a, I almost have a mini operating system inside my code base because we have our own thread pool, which means we have our own scheduler. We have to, we have our own smart pointers. We are going to have to have our own uh, lock-free code because there's not a whole lot in C++ 11. If I have to have all of this stuff anyway, I'm probably going to like my stuff better than whatever the standard comes up with because the stuff I designed fit my use cases. And I know all of the corner cases in my use cases. Um, I don't know. If, I feel like this is, a, um, this is a difficulty. I would like my code to look as much like standard C++ as possible because some of the, code, some of the developers we hire know C++, and I don't want to have to teach them a whole lot of new concepts to use our code. But at the same time, I kind of like that I, it's a little bit harder to have a slicing issue with delete putter than with the std unique pointer. Um, it's possible, since I know my own use cases, I get better performance. I may, you know, there's other things, like unordered map turned out to be a bad API, but we're stuck with it. Um, there are better ways of doing hash tables, uh, but, but I'm going to have to roll my own if I want one or wait for at least 2023. Um, and I don't know, in some sense, I feel this is, this is a hard problem to solve. As a standards committee, you want to give people tools that they can use, but at the same time, you have to give them tools that fit all use cases, which means I can't say, well, no, my use case is actually more limited, and I want more safety belts. Um, I'm not sure how you solve that problem. I don't think you can. But it's, a, it's certainly a thing to think about when, when deciding to use standard tools, which are convenient, but maybe slightly have slightly more, in some sense, they have more sharp edges than something you might have written yourself. Um, you could ask the question, does language affect, affect thought? And I did a little bit of reading on this, and the linguistics community seems to be mostly agreed that the language you learn doesn't really affect how you think because you don't really think in words, but at the same time, it really affects how you express things. Um, and, and so in my code base, if everything I see is an owned or a plain old data type, I'm probably going to continue that pattern. And I'm probably going to continue to think about virtual APIs and a little bit about factories because the implementation is hidden. And that's all I can really easily express in my system. And I'm not sure that's a bad thing, right? It, it continues to having all the code look the same. I don't have to think about a second kind of ownership model. 
And I think that was it. Yeah. So name's Manoril. Um, and really, I said all of this stuff already. So let me just confirm that's my last slide. Yep. I have some stuff in the appendix about a couple other not super interesting smart pointer types. I don't know if this is an interest. I've got 25 minutes left. Uh, are there any questions? Does this feel like, I mean, I don't expect you guys to go and say, hey, great, Owen, can you put that up on GitHub? I want to use it in my code base. But um, I'm hoping that at least this concept that a, while a smart pointer does represent ownership, it might be nice. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't, know if I'd, I don't know if I'd have the energy to write the paper, but I'm not, I wouldn't be opposed to something like borrowed and out param ending up in the standard. Because I think there is a, I feel like there's a little bit of a danger when you have a consensus, when you try to see in your code base, well, raw pointers don't mean, mean no ownership. Like in our code base, that's basically true now. And we haven't converted all of our APIs, but I think almost everything that actually has ownership really expresses it. But I still have, have, have twice fixed essentially the same bug where somebody took ownership over a raw pointer because they thought they were supposed to, and they weren't supposed to. And we had a double free, and it took a long time to debug because the, the symptom is you think you're calling dispose when the resource is actually being reset, and you call some random other virtual function, and you crash in other weird ways. And so finding who the owner was who reset it earlier can be really tough. Um, so I kind of think I might like something in the standard that lets me always express clearly, this is owned, this is not owned, and maybe w why it's not owned. It's, I'm borrowing it for a temporary view, or it's some out parameter you're filling in because there's asynchronicity going on. Um, so, questions, thoughts? Yes? So have you seen any, any implementations or, or home world smart pointer similar to this in other applications or um, code bases? Question is, have I seen other implementations like this in other code bases? Uh, I haven't looked, honestly. Um, I, there's a bit of danger with me looking at random code on the internet because I, as an employee, have intellectual property uh, considerations for my employer. I have to at least know the license before I look. Um, but it turns out I just, I don't end up having the time. <laughs> so I, d I have not looked for that. I would not be, I wouldn't be surprised if people did things like unique putter. That's a really common thing you want. Um, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure that stuff came from Boost. Um, I could be wrong. Uh, on that, but but this own the concept of this own thing that has it inherits from a virtual API and just says dispose you do what you want. I don't it doesn't it doesn't feel like the kind of thing you'd invent yourself unless you accidentally came from that C background where you had function pointers that told you what to do with the resource. I mean again it could be wrong. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you.